أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Hope everybody is well الحمد لله uh, Am I audible? Good um, morning Are you able to You there? Um, would, would, would I be able to get an indication from anybody um, if it's audible or? Uh, it's all good, Sheikh. I can hear. Okay. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Um, Alhamdulillah. Uh, for your patience and um, persevering these last couple of weeks. Um, as, you, as you know, it was quite busy on my side and uh, the class kind of went on a uh, ad hoc basis. But inshallah, we will. Um, We'll pick it up again and um, prof, uh, most likely in the new year so it's most likely our last session and for the year and I'm sure everybody has had a very busy 2022 alhamdulillah it might be prosperous and we look forward to uh, a better year with the best of our days lay ahead alhamdulillah i mean and um, just wanted to conclude um the semester or the the year with um you know with a with a class and, and, and to formally thank the students for for persevering there's only five of you, and two of you are Burhan, so it's only three of you that have uh, actually the last standing three. But I'm sure the others will join um, and, and watch on YouTube as well. Um, as I mentioned last week, that you know it's about the consistency that's important, both from a student and a teacher perspective, and that's what 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 makes it successful, and what makes it difficult, the consistency, because we won't always have the the, the time, we won't always have uh, um, the luxury just to attend, but we must maintain it. And even if it means we take a little bit of a, a, a back step, we never leave it off completely. And so the Sahaba, when they would do a, a good deed, you know, maybe they would perform, start performing tajud. And, you know, in the beginning, you may be quite uh, eager. And as you go on, you become sick, you become, you travel, you become busy, and you can't maintain that same level of ibadah. And what is, re what is recommended in those situations is that you have to obviously do a bit of less of the ibadah but don't leave it off completely don't completely quit that is that would be bad and so if you think of ramadan for example ramadan you 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 make you know a, a khatam or a number of khatams um, you're fasting every single day you're making tajud at night at the end of ramadan you cannot have the same level of ibadah as you had in ramadan and that's fine that's normal that's that's, that's ex what's expected but do not leave all the ibadah you know don't completely leave off Quran that you don't own, you don't, you never touch the Quran until the next year. That you never perform a single uh, nafil fast or a single act of tajud um, until the next year Ramadan. That would be completely leaving it off. And so, Alhamdulillah, the barakah is in the perseverance. We know the very, very famous hadith where the Nabi says the deeds that Allah loves the most after the compulsory ones are the sunnah ones or the nafil ones or the uh, optional ones that are done regularly and consistently, even they are small. Even though they are small, five minutes, ten minutes consistently is better than to do a lot all at once. And that is where the barakah comes in, because that's the hard part, the consistency. And so I thank the class, alhamdulillah, for being consistent. If I look at this, um, you know, we are on lecture number 30. Um, that's really good, alhamdulillah, which means most of the weeks, um, and we started this, I think, during the year. So most of the weeks for the year, we have had this class, alhamdulillah. And um, we, com you know, we concluded quite a bit from the introduction to the basics of Islam, the theology of, 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 of Islam in a very basic, and we moved on now to the rituals and spoke about uh, uh, wudu. And in fact, we are going to complete wudu today. Um, what we had spoken about in the last few lectures was, we just a recap very, very quickly. Um, so my slides are sharing, share screen. So if we were to recap very quickly, we had spoken about um, when does, uh, 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 you know, the, when does one require wudu, you require wudu before you perform salah, before you perform the tawaf, and of course if you are touching the mushaf, to touch the mushaf, not reciting it, you may recite the Quran without wudu, that's permissible. Um, we then spoke about how to perform wudu, 
and we went through the ayah of wudu in Surah Al-Ma'idah where Allah explains the process of wudu, the steps of wudu. We also then mention the, um, the, in the, the besides the compulsory actions of wudu, there are a number of recommended additional things that one needs to do for, for your wudu, like you know the niya and starting with your hands uh, and du'as and all those things. So we spoke about the complete the, the wudu which is compulsory from the Quran, and then we spoke about the uh, a complete wudu and all the pillars of wudu that is required for it to be acceptable. We then um, asked what are the things that nullify the wudu. We spoke about things that break your wudu or invalidate your wudu. When does one need to perform wudu again? And we said that within this issue, this is there are a number of 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 um, there are those things which all these scholars agree on. Which, for example, they all agree that if anything comes out of the front or back passage, the front or the back. Um, private part, um, if any substance, solid, liquid or gas comes out of that area, then your wudu is nullified. And they all agree, all the scholars of Islam agree, that if you lose your uh, um, your intellect, you, you lose your senses, you go unconscious, for whatever reason, your wudu would, would invalidate. We then see that there are a few areas which the scholars differed. And the one we discussed last time was the issue of a skin on skin or a contact contact between a man and a woman and this is very famous within the in the Shafi madhab where a man and a woman who could get married to one another either they are married husband and wife or it is a strange woman or man that may get married if they touch each other whether deliberately whether accidentally whether with desire whether without desire if there is any contact between them without a barrier would your would do is invalidated that is per the Shafi opinion the majority of the scholars disagree with this view and we spoke about in length what is the Shafi opinion, what are the, the, the Hanafi opinion is the opposite and then you have the middle opinion, the Hanbali and the Maliki opinion and um, not to go into too much detail of recapping we said the Shafi opinion um, is based on the understanding of the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Awla mastumun nisa that if you have come in contact with women if you have touched a woman, then you need to basically perform wudu. And so the Shafi says very explicitly in the Quran, lumps means to touch. Allah says, if you've made lumps, you've touched a woman, then you need to perform wudu. The Shafi opinion is that, straight from the Quran. The Hanafis, of course, disagree with that. And they said, no, oh Shafis, we agree. Obviously, we believe in the ayah, we understand the ayah. But our interpretation of the word lumps, our understanding of the word lumps is not touch in a literal sense. It means if you have had intercourse with a woman, then you need to perform a ghusl. That is what the ayah is saying. And they add to that, in the words before it, Allah says that if you have come from the toilet, you must perform wudu. Now, everyone understands coming from the toilet doesn't mean if you went in and out of the toilet, you, you need to perform wudu. What is meant there, if you've used the toilet, if you basically urinated or defecated, then you need to perform wudu. But Allah is speaking in very polite language in the Quran. Allah is not going to say that if you defecated, urinated and had sex, then you need to purify yourself. So Allah is using, you know, euphemisms. And that's what the Hanafis are saying. So we have the opinion of the Shafis, which says, any kind of touch breaks your wudu. The Hanafis say, no, touching a woman does not break your wudu. And so we have these two evidences. And both sides, as we said, they are reading the same ayah and extracting the, a different conclusion based on the same ayah. Sincerely, with love, with uh, 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 understanding, they've come to genuinely a different conclusion. So then we said, okay, the Shafis then counter this argument. And, and, and for me, what is important is the academic discussion, it is the intellectual conversation that is happening between these uh, different scholars that gives you a lot of co confidence that our religion is one that is based on, on, on knowledge and it's based on learning and it's based on, um, it's based on, on a lot of uh, uh, different opinions, it's good. It was any person can take the Quran and read it and postulate, you can come up with an opinion so long as it, so long as it's reasonable, so long as it makes sense linguistically or it has some basis. But anyone has the right to interpret the Quran so long as it's done uh, um, correctly. And so the Shafi'is then respond to the Hanafis. Okay, so you're saying this ayah says that if you have intercourse with a woman, then only do you need to perform a ghusl. So everything before intercourse does not break your wudu. 
So you can kiss her on the mouth, doesn't break your wudu. You can be laying naked next to one another, cuddling, spooning, doesn't break your wudu. You can be rubbing and touching, it doesn't break your wudu. And the Hanafis would say, Let, from our understanding of the ayah, it doesn't break your wudu so long as nothing exits the front or back passage. If anything comes out of the front passage, some substances or witness, then your wudu is broken. But everything other than that does not break your wudu. And the Hanafis go further and say, there is a hadith, authentic hadith, that the Nabi وسلم, he kissed Aisha on her mouth, on her lips, and then he went to perform salah without performing wudu. And this is an authentic hadith. Aisha radiallahu anha says that, and she speaks now, and this is uh, one of the softness of the hadith, um, she says that the Prophet ﷺ kissed one of his wives on the mouth and then he went to perform salah without performing wudu. And the fact that she is saying without performing wudu, she wants to emphasize the issue that it does not break your wudu. And so her nephew, she's telling this to her nephew, her nephew Urwa says, I think auntie, when you say he kissed one of his wives, you mean you. You're actually talking about yourself? And she didn't respond, she just smiled, meaning, yes, it was me. And so this hadith clearly shows that it is permissible to even kiss your wife on the mouth with desire and perform salah without performing wudu, a new wudu, so long as nothing comes out of the private parts. So that's the Hanafi view. The Shafi view sticks to the literal sense of the ayah, and we said the Shafi view is safest. The Shafi view undoubtedly is safe. And if you've always practiced the Shafi opinion, alhamdulillah, no problem with that, maintain that, uh, but understand that is the stricter interpretation. We then have the Malikis and the Hanbalis who find themselves in the middle between the Hanafis and the Shafis, and they said, you know what, we understand from the Hanafis that perhaps the ayah does mean intercourse. We have the hadith of Aisha being kissed by the Nabi Sallam. However, we find it very, very difficult that people should have foreplay and they should have all kinds of interactions with desire and still they would do is fine we find something difficult with us and it opens the door for uh, a lot of potential problems so as a middle ground the malikis and the hanbalis have basically said if you touch a woman by accident if you touch her you know part of daily life unintentionally no problem would do is fine you in tawaf and someone bumps into you no problem would do is fine but if you touch with desire, if you touch with love, if you touch with uh, an intention of, of, of an amorous kind of touch, then your wudu is broken per these madhabs. And it's basically a compromise view between the Shafi and Hanafi opinion. Allah Alam, as we said at the end of the day, uh, um, you have, uh, this is a very good example of showing, you have the strict opinion, which is the Shafi opinion. You have the majority opinion, which is the Maliki and Hanbali view that you touch with desire with lust you would lose broken and you have perhaps what we'd say the not correct opinion but the one that speaks to the evidence which is the Hanafi opinion but it's also the most liberal opinion but it speaks to the evidences well, alhamdulillah based on this there were questions around so should I change my madhab what do we do and we said it is not permissible to chop and change your madhab based on whims and fancies you need to if you're a lay person and by layperson, I mean you haven't formally studied in a Darul Ulum, in an Islamic university, you haven't spent, you know, three, four, five years studying Sharia. So you are a layperson. As, as I, for example, I'm not a mechanic, I'm not a plumber, I'm not an electrician. I never studied these things. I might know a little bit about how to change a tire or how to do a few things on the car, but I'm not a mechanic. We know the difference between a professional mechanic and a guy who can do a few things on the car. Um, so if you are a lay person, then your job is to make taqlid. Taqlid means you choose an alim or a sheikh or a maulana or a madhab and you say, look, this is the alim. I have uh, put my trust in and confidence in him. Doesn't mean that I delegate my mind and intelligence to him, but I follow the opinion of the scholar. And alhamdulillah, whichever madhab you make taqlid of, if you follow the Hanafi madhab, or the Shafi madhab, or the Maliki madhab, or the Hanbali madhab, or minority opinions within those madhabs, because not all, the, not all of the opinions are unanimous. In the madhab, you might have disagreement as well. So you choose a scholar who is recognized as a, a, a scholar of the Sharia, and you follow the opinions, alhamdulillah, that is fine. If you have reached the level of being a mujtahid, a person who can academically understand different opinions, then you have the uh, s s the flexibility 
to sincerely choose an opinion outside of your madhab. So if you've studied formally, you're a maulana, you're a sheikh, you've studied a few years in, in Medina, and you have understood the books and the conversations of the scholars, and now you say of all these opinions, it's a buffet of opinions, they're all acceptable. Hanafi opinion is fine, Shafi opinion is fine. You know, we choose the one that is the most acceptable from the evidence, and you do so sincerely. You don't choose convenience. You don't take the madhab, oh, I like that one. Oh, I choose this opinion because it's easy. When it comes to prawns, Shafi opinion is good because the Hanafis don't like prawns. So I don't, I'm not Hanafi when it comes to prawns. When it comes to touching a woman, oh, I'm, I'm Hanafi. When it comes to traveling, Hanafis have 15 days, I choose them. When it comes to Qasr and Jam, the Shafis are, are more lenient there, I choose them. That is not permissible. You choose it based on the evidence. And then of course, but within a spectrum of acceptability, you should not choose an opinion outside of the four madhabs. Very, very unlikely that there would be an opinion, especially if it's a classical discussion. We're not talking about contemporary stuff, brain surgery, space travel. Those things are perhaps more uh, you know, novel, new. Those things might not be within the standard madhabs, but any classical kind of discussion, you would stick to the four madhabs and those would cover all the acceptable opinions. If you, of course, reach the level of being a mufti, then you can develop your own independent opinions, and inshallah, uh, um, all of that is fine. So, this is with regards to touching a woman and breaking your wudu. There's also an opinion within the Shafi'i Madhab, and it's based on a hadith, that if you were to touch your private part directly, without any covering, Yours or another person, so maybe you change the baby's nappy and you touch the baby's private part by accident, then your wudu would be broken. Your wudu would be broken. Touching najasa, if the baby pees on you or urinates on you, that would not break your wudu. But to touch the baby's private part while cleaning the baby, that, according to the Shafi Madha, breaks your wudu. So, in summary, what are the things that, okay, we'll talk about the nullifiers. Some things which do not break your wudu, some things which would not invalidate your wudu, uh, and, and sometimes people confuse these things. Touching najasa, as we said, if the baby urinated on the floor, and you now clean that najasa with uh, a, a, a piece of toilet paper, and some of that urine, some of that feces came on your fingers, your wudu is fine, your wudu is not broken. So any, or, or, or you know, you're walking, and as you walk, you step in some dog feces or whatever it is, and it got, got on your skin, it would not break your wudu. You obviously have to clean it before you make salah. You have to remove it from your body, your clothing, but it does not break your wudu. So coming in contact with najasa does not break your wudu. But if najasa exits your body, very important to know the difference. If your own najasa exits your body, whether through the front passage, back passage, or some kind of other, through a pipe, then your wudu would break. Vomiting does not break your wudu. Yes, some scholars have said vomit is najis, but the, the, the majority view and the most, inshallah, correct view is that vomiting in itself does not break your wudu. Becoming naked. There are some people who have this idea that if I become naked, I undress, my wudu breaks. Or they would say, for example, um, and you find this a lot when they're performing ghusl, they will say, I ghusl, I'm naked, and I ghusl myself, and we'll, we will talk about ghusl next year, inshallah. When I'm, ghusl is, for those who are not familiar, is a full body shower. So, I'm naked when I shower, when I ghusl. Now I need to perform wudu, do I need to put my clothes on and then perform wudu? Because I can't be naked when performing wudu. That would, being naked does not break your wudu. Being, becoming naked in itself, undressing yourself, does not break your wudu. Why would it break your wudu? And lastly, Committing sin itself does not break your wudu. So if someone, and we're not saying it's permissible or it's okay or underplaying the sin, but if someone swears or they look at something which is haram or they say something haram or do something haram, it would not break your wudu. It would not invalidate your wudu simply by committing a sin. You tell a lie. Of course, of course, what we do have in the Sharia is that by performing wudu, you remove sins. So perhaps from the angle, and that's perhaps why there is this uh, 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 misconception, that when a person committed a sin, scholars would perhaps recommend them to perform wudu and make tawbah and istighfar. It wasn't that your wudu was broken, but performing a fresh wudu, a new wudu, removes the sin. So it is not that you perform wudu to uh, uh, um, put yourself into the state of tahara. If a person had wudu and they committed a sin, 
perform a new wudu to remove the sin, but you were already in the state of wudu. Is there any questions on these points that we've made? Ubaid, do you have any questions? You usually have good questions. Uh, not this time, Sheikh. Not this time. Okay. Anyone from the um, from the class? Any questions? Oh, actually, I do have one question. Ubaid has a question. Yes. So, so vomiting naturally doesn't break your wudu. What about intention? Intentional vomiting doesn't break your wudu. However, intentional vomiting breaks your fast. So sometimes we get confused with the things that break our fast, with the things that break our wudu, with the things that break our ihram in hajj or umrah. So sometimes people are confused that if I vomit, it won't break your wudu, but it breaks your fast if it's done deliberately. Going to the toilet, or being in Haid, for example, a lady in her mens menses. Obviously, it breaks wudu. wudu. You can't have wudu while you're menstruating. You also cannot fast while menstruating, but you can be in ihram while menstruating. The lady can still be in the state of ihram. She can still go, go to Arafah in her ihram while she's menstruating. And so sometimes we get confused by what breaks my wudu, ihram, and fasting. Because all three of those things, wudu, you can't see wudu. You can't see fasting, and you can't see ihram. It's a state that you're in. And so sometimes these lists of things that nullify wudu, ihram, and fasting becomes intertwined. Vomiting breaks fasting, but it deliberate vomiting would not break your wudu. Any other questions? Also, just on, 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 on as we're mentioning fasting, uh, or oh, sorry, ihram, um, alhamdulillah, we are now in December, and many people, uh, alhamdulillah, they do the best thing they can do in their holidays is they take off and they go for umrah. It's the best holiday you can go for. Um, the most rewarding inshallah and um, we are having now this weekend um, the 10th of December um, at half past eight at the Bulan al-Masjid we're having a mini crash course a three four hour session on, 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 on Umrah so if anybody would like to attend you'd like you're going for Umrah or you know someone is going for Umrah it's good to refresh your knowledge so that when you get there you don't forget any of the important stuff we, some, we only go for Umrah um, you know, once in a while, and so sometimes the knowledge becomes rusty, um, especially if, you, if it's your first time, then um, perhaps it's a very good session to come and join us for our, our Umrah class. Unfortunately, it won't be online, it will only be live, um, um, uh, you know, in person here at the Masjid, um, and you can sign up. For those of you who are not able to attend physically, but you'd like to join, we could perhaps create a special link for you, and so you can just message us, and we will, inshallah, uh, um, accommodate you. Okay, so those are the things that do not break your wudu. So to end off, inshallah, let's, not to end off, but uh, let's to summarize. What are the things that break your wudu? So in summary, and this is a detailed summary now, this is not Islam from scratch, this is uh, a little more than scratch. The thing that everybody, there are two things which all four madhabs agree breaks your wudu, and that is any substance exiting the front or the back passage. They all agree on that. Slight nuances here and there, but take that as a rule. And they all agree, all four mothers agree, that if you lose your consciousness, your wudu is broken. The Shafi'is add to the list, and they specifically, and they say that skin on skin tongue, uh, contact between a uh, man and a woman breaks your wudu. We spoke about that at length. And they also said that if you touch a sexual organ directly, your own or someone else's, that breaks your wudu. That's only to the Shafi'is, the other mothers don't agree with that. The Hanafis, the Hanafis have a lot of things, vomiting, for example, bleeding, breaks your wudu. And sometimes you say, oh, the Hanafis are very liberal. Yeah, there is uh, uh, um, other things that if uh, a person laughs too loudly in salah, the, where do these things come from? There's obviously reasons why they say that. But a lot of their uh, discussion is around what is najis. So the Hanafi madhab, again, they are very strict with what is najis. They'll say pus, for example, is najis. Blood is najis. Vomit is najis. And so as we said, the rule is, if najasa exits your body, it will break your wudu. And so for them, vomiting, bleeding, even a nosebleed, they'll say a, 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 a heavy nosebleed will break your wudu. That if you have a wound, it will break your wudu. And so this is uh, uh, based on the Hanafi opinion. And that's why, alhamdulillah, and everything is, comes down to rules and hadith and, and discussion. All these opinions have evidences behind it. And you have co counter evidence as well. Well, alhamdulillah, this point, which is inshallah our last point, for this um, semester, if you want to call it the year, um, the next section would be on Husserl. But this last point, and if anybody, if you were sleeping or un, not listening uh, for the last couple of weeks, 
you really want to listen to this. You really want to listen. In fact, maybe Ubaid should make a little voice, uh, a small little you know, TikTok clip for this one. Every single one of us, at some point in your life, you've asked the question, did I break my wudu or not? How many times a day are you unsure, do I have wudu or don't I have wudu? And you sort of think in your mind, I remember performing dhuwr or fajr. Did I go to the toilet? Did I pass some wind? Did I fall? Is my wudu there or not there? Do I need to perform a new one or not? All of us have been there, done that. What is the ruling? So the question, what is the ruling when you are in doubt with regards to wudu? Or in, rea in reality, the golden rule is with regards to any doubt in, the, in Islam. So there are many times that one can be in doubt. You can be in doubt, do I have wudu or not wudu? You can be in doubt, how many rakahs did I make? So you're making ishai. Am I, have I made three or four or am I short? How many rakahs am I? You, you lost track of, of, of count. You're performing tawaf. Which round am I in? I should make seven. And I'm, am I in number five or number four? I'm not sure. So doubt creeps in. And what is what happens when we are doubtful? So most of us, perhaps, we grew up and the imam basically said, you know, be played safe. If you're not sure you have wudu, take wudu. If you're not sure if you made the, uh, um, uh, you're in raka'ah number three or four, then make an extra one just to be safe. Make an extra one. Uh, that's fine. You can play it safe. No, no problem with that. But that's technically not the correct opinion. The correct opinion, and take this as a principle, it's a law in Islam, that certainty is not removed by doubt. I say again, certainty is not removed by doubt. So whenever you are in a situation of confusion, ask yourself, what am I certain of and what am I doubtful of? So let me give an example with wudu. Muhammad took wudu for fajr. He made salah for fajr. He then got into his car and he drove to work. Three, four hours later, it's door and he's about to perform door and he's asking himself, did I break my wudu? And now he's going through the steps of the morning. He can't remember going to the toilet. He can't remember passing any gas. He's sure he didn't sleep. So he's not sure, do I have wudu or not? He's a shafi and he says, look, I haven't touched any person. I, 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 you know, I left a house and I didn't even greet my wife, subhanAllah, or the bad husband. I didn't kiss her goodbye, but I didn't touch her. So now I'm not sure if I've broken my wudu. Maybe when I spoke to that lady and she gave me the paper, our hands touched. I don't know, I can't remember. So what do we advise Muhammad? Do we say, look, be safe, Muhammad, and take wudu again? We say, no. What are you certain of? I'm certain I had wudu. I'm 100% sure I had wudu because I made fajr. 100% sure. I'm doubtful if I broke my wudu. So we say, okay, we are certain we had wudu. We are doubtful that we broke wudu. We throw the doubt away. The doubt is, did I break wudu? I throw it away and I keep what is certain, which is I had wudu. And so we say to you, Muhammad, no need to make a new wudu. Perform your word salah. Walhamdulillah. If while he's performing salah, he then remembers, oh, I did go to the toilet. Well, then you're no longer doubtful. You need to go and perform wudu and perform your salah over. However, let's turn the scenario around. Muhammad is sure he didn't have wudu. He knows I went to the toilet. I know I went to the toilet. I used the toilet. I'm not sure if I made a new wudu again. I'm not sure. Very unlikely you would forget making wudu, but it's possible. You could lose track of time and say, I'm not sure if the wudu I made was yesterday or was it earlier. I'm not sure. I know I broke my wudu. So the wudu is uncertain. We throw the wudu away in the scenario and we say, what is certain is you did not have wudu and therefore your opinion is you don't have wudu or the ruling is you don't have wudu, go and perform wudu again. As I said, it's most, most unlikely that you'd forget performing wudu, but you would definitely forget breaking wudu. And therefore, many a times, if you play this rule, you would save yourself from performing multiple wudus without you know, needing to do it. And so Alhamdulillah, this is a easy uh, rule and it is a rukhsa. It's something which benefits us in the sharia. Ah. In other areas like salah, if you are unsure, did I make three or four rakahs, then I, you are unsure about number four, but you are definitely certain this is either number three or number four. You, you then obviously do an extra rakah ah because what is certain is that I'm on number three. I'm doubtful if this is the last rakah. Ah. And the same with tawaf or anything else. You base your opinion on what is what is certain, insha'Allah. Insha'Allah, the next area of discussion will be ghusl. And ghusl is to 
to perform a major wudu, a shower, a complete, where, whereas wudu washes certain parts of the body, ghusl washes the entire body. And so inshallah, this will be our discussion into the new year. When do I need a ghusl? How do I perform a ghusl? What happens if there's no water? We'll talk a bit about tayammum as well, inshallah. But that the, those things, if Allah allows for us to rejoin, we will begin with those items. And once again, as I say, jazakallah khair um, for the class. Um, I know that it has been a little bit chaotic these last few weeks. Alhamdulillah, work on my side um, by the grace of Allah has become a little bit more manageable. But it is unfortunately December time. And I think everybody, um, myself included, um, would be keen for a little bit of a, a breather, a little bit of a break. And um, we will, inshallah, um, reconvene in the new year at a time which is convenient for everybody. But you are welcome to share your questions and your comments via our WhatsApp line or email. Um, I'm sure during the holidays a number of questions tend to come up. Um, we'll respond as best we can. And um, Allah accept from us. As I said, this is episode number 30. When we started, we had over 3,000 students. We are now left with about three or four, alhamdulillah. And that's always the purpose of is uh, we continue to teach and um, to benefit with what we have. So may Allah accept from us. And I hope that it was beneficial to all of you, that you've learned something and that it, it was not a, a waste of your time. Whatever we said that was good and beneficial, it is from the grace and the tawfiq of Allah. Whatever we said of wrong and mistakes, and this is from ourselves and shaitan, may Allah forgive us for that and reward us to our best of uh, intentions. And again, a special thank you for um, to to the Burano team, in particular Ubaid, alhamdulillah. He is um, really the star of the show because he's here an hour or so before the class starts to set up and he is here long after we leave to, to pack up, um, edits the videos and puts it out there. So alhamdulillah, he has not missed a single class. I've missed a few, but he's not missed a single class, alhamdulillah. So may Allah accept from him and put barakah in his, in his life. Ameen. Are there any questions before we conclude? Any questions or comments? Then jazakallah khair to all of you and all the best and we will reconvene inshallah in the new year. May Allah grant us all the best over this period, safety and security and grant that next year be better than this year. May Allah accept. Ameen. Jazakallah khair. Wa sallallahu sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.